Hi, this is Professor Karen Magruder, and I'm making this overview video of the DSM-5 not only to help my students who may be considering a career in mental health or pursuing their LCSW at some point, also for students who might not be specializing in mental health but want to know this information perhaps for a licensing exam, and just for all social workers to have some foundational knowledge of the DSM for their practice and for licensing preparation as well. So first I'm going to start with a disclaimer here. I don't represent the DSM-5, um, and although I'm currently a professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Arlington, I'm just making this, you know, for, for my students and for resources for others, so it's not officially uh, affiliated with the, the university. This is just what I gathered from the DSM-5 and how it helps me to organize and think about it. I'm going to start with some background and history about the DSM and talk a little bit about other um, versions of the DSM and then we'll go into each category and each of the specific disorders as well. So the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's published by the American Psychiatric Association and it's currently in its fifth edition and it's mostly just used here in the U.S. The number one use of the DSM is for medical insurance reimbursement. So if you're a private practice therapist, for example, and you want to get reimbursement from, say, Blue Cross Blue Shield, you'll need to have a diagnosis and a, an issue that you're working on and helping that client with, and you'll use the DSM codes for that. It also can help provide understanding of conditions for both clients and mental health practitioners and provide direction for treatment and intervention as well. The DSM-5 was published in 2013, and each new edition of the DSM has certainly brought about some controversies and really does reflect changing attitudes in society. For, so for example, the DSM version three included homosexuality as one of the mental disorders. And so that just goes to show how the DSM is in some senses a cultural artifact as well. You might be wondering, why does it matter? Why do I care about any of the previous editions? Well, it's important to understand trends and controversies and also to recognize old terminology. So for example, in the DSM-4, there was a condition called Asperger's and that was part of the, the autism um, kind of umbrella. And now in the DSM, Asperger's has gone away and it's just part of the autism spectrum. But you may still hear people referring to Asperger's probably for quite some time. And so it's helpful to know, oh, that's what they're talking about. That's from the DSM-4. And also to know that that's not you know, used currently. Another example is NOS, which stands for not otherwise specified. That was an acronym used frequently in the DSM-4, which is not in the 5 anymore. But if you see that, then you know what that means. The, the My lesson here is not to be a diagnostic dinosaur, okay? So um, keep up to date with changes in the DSM and don't be caught being a dinosaur and using old terminology. Some major differences between the 4 and the 5, um, you'll notice here, first of all, that the DSM-4 used Roman numerals and the DSM-5 uses uh, the number 5. And so that's, that's the correct way. It's 5 and not the, the letter V. Uh, it's organized, and, and the reason for that is because they're planning to make updates eventually, and it's kind of like a software program, where it's maybe Microsoft Word, you know, 5.6 or whatever. So it's gonna, they're gonna have 5.1 and 5.2 um, instead of the way that they did it before with revised editions. So um, DSM-4 was the symptoms or the uh, the conditions rather were organized by age of onset, starting in childhood and moving up whereas the DSM-5 is organized by similarity of symptoms. The DSM-4 was atheoretical, meaning there wasn't a particular theoretical orientation like, say, the psychodynamic perspective, which was more pervasive in the first and second edition. Um, it was kind of theory neutral. And DSM-5 um, tended to move a little bit away from being a theoretical, and many people say that the DSM-5 is more focused on uh, neuroscience and medical reductionism, but that's certainly up for debate. And then in the DSM-4, there were four axes of, of different diagnostic labels. In the DSM-5, there are no axes. So if you see anything about, oh, this is an axis one disorder, an axis three, you know, consideration, 
um, they're referring to DSM-4 that's not used anymore. Some controversies just to be aware of, um, certainly about the control and creation and updating, you know, who gets to make those decisions. What is the diagnostic criteria? So an example here would be for grief and depression, looking at the grief exclusion for major depressive disorder and these norms around how long is it normal or appropriate to grieve someone before it turns into, say, depression um, or something like an adjustment disorder, how long is okay. Also scientific versus strategic reasoning. So we would like to think that all of this is developed based on empirical evidence, but we know as an example that sometimes disorders are developed because of strategic reasons. That doesn't mean that they're nefarious necessarily, but there can be um, those underpinnings. So example being disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. This really was created in response to the over prescription of medications for basically childhood bipolar disorder in kids, and so they created this new disorder um, to combat some issues related to that. There's also concern about stigma. If someone gets a diagnosis, particularly of uh, a very severe mental illness, like maybe schizophrenia, for example, that can come back to haunt them if that's in their me medical records and they want to be a part of, you know, for example, the military or the police force or the CIA or something like that. And there's also concerns about self-fulfilling prophecies, that once someone has a label, um, that they see that as being part of their identity and uh, that it can become the self-fulfilling prophecy as well. How is the DSM organized? So I've created this graphic here to show how each section basically comes out. You have several different categories, and then within that category of disorders, there's the specific disorders, which I'll list out here. And then there's the substance or medication induced version of that issue, that issue due to another medical condition, something that's other specified of that category or unspecified. So that's really the layout within each section. You'll also see codes. Those are used often for reimbursement. And then there's also uh, the ICD codes, the international classification, uh, which is used in, in other countries uh, as well. So right now we're on the ICD-10. And then there's the diagnostic criteria. That's the part that most people look at. But then there's also sections like talking about the prevalent, prevalence of the disorder and differential diagnosis, which is extremely helpful if you're not sure what's the difference between this and that disorder. And you can see some of the differences and similarities and what distinguishes this diagnosis from something that might be similar. The very first category is neurodevelopmental disorders. This would include intellectual disabilities, communication disorders, autism spectrum, ADHD, specific learning disorder, and motor disorders as well. And I'll go into some of these in more detail. Of course, the DSM is a massive book with a lot of detail and I can't cover it exhaustively here. But in this lecture, I'm just going to talk about some of the perhaps more common issues that social workers either work with or might need to know for licensing exam information. The first is intellectual disability. So please do not call it mental retardation. This is the appropriate term now, intellectual disability or intellectual developmental disorder. It's a deficit in intellectual functioning with things like learning, thinking, or judgment, and a failure to meet developmental milestones for independence and social responsibility. It has to develop before the age of 18 and not be due to another medical condition like a stroke. And you'll see that as a common criteria in a lot of conditions. It has to not be due to a medical disorder or substance use or something like that. And then in terms of IQ ranges, here are the different levels of mild, moderate, and severe and what the typical IQ range is for that level of intellectual disability. Global developmental delay is used for kids who are under age five when you can't reliably assess the above features um, with clinical assessment or standardized tests. So these features I was talking about here, this little guy here, maybe he's glaring at us because uh, he can't take a standardized test. So if he wasn't you know, um, achieving these things, we might say he has a global developmental delay until we can do further testing as he gets a bit older. There's a few different types of communication disorders. So we have this larger umbrella of neurodevelopmental and then communication disorders is a subset of that. And here are some examples of that. 
Um, child onset fluency disorder is really just a fancy term for stuttering, so being aware of that as well. The next is autism spectrum disorder. And so there, you need to have all three of these social deficits that are listed here, social emotional reciprocity, nonverbal communication, and developing and maintaining friendships. And then at least two of these things, which are in the category of restrictive, repetitive behaviors or interests. So that could be stereotyped or repetitive movement, inflexible adherence to routine, fixated interests, kind of obsessions um, about a topic, for example, and being hypersensitive to sensory input. ADHD, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, needs to occur for at least six months and needs to develop by age 12. And the diagnostic criteria is really related to inattention and hyperactivity. Specific learning disorder, you can have three different types, reading, writing, or math, and it needs to last also for about six months. Another category within neurodevelopmental is motor disorders. And here is the list of different motor disorders. People might be most familiar with Tourette's disorder. The next category is schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. And here's a list of some of the disorders that are included within this category. And again, I'll talk about a bit of these in more detail. Delusional disorder. So that's where you're not necessarily seeing or hearing things, but you have these delusions, which are these fixed ideas or beliefs that are um, not correct and not true and not amenable to um, facts or reasonable persuasion. You need to have them for at least a month and they tend to fall into these five different categories. Erotomanic, so maybe you think someone's in love with you. Grandiosity, jealous, persecutory, this is quite common. They think, you know, someone's after them. There's a, a degree of paranoia. And then somatic, something to do with the body or physical symptoms. And you may hear uh, delusions categorized as being bizarre or non-bizarre. And you might be saying to yourself, well, they all sound bizarre to me. But what that actually means is if something is bizarre, that means that it's implausible and it's not derived from ordinary life experiences. So, for example, I think aliens invaded my body and implanted a device in my stomach. That would be a bizarre behavior or a, a bizarre delusion. Whereas um, I think the police are watching me and I'm being uh, under surveillance, that would be a non-bizarre. It might still be untrue, but it could theoretically be possible in this universe. Schizophrenia, you have those delusions and also hallucinations that can be seeing things, hearing things, or even smelling or tasting or feeling things that are not there. And then also disorganized speech. So things like word salad, or there's a lot of different categories of disorganized speech. You have to at least have two of those three um, in for at least a month. And then you also have to have grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior. And, and there can also be positive or negative um, symptoms. So I'm just gonna skip to this here. The positive symptoms, this means, again, not that it's a good thing, but rather that there is the presence of something, whereas a negative symptom means that it's the absence of something. So positive symptoms could be hallucinations, delusions, and disorganized speech. Those are things that weren't there in a healthy individual. Um, whereas apathy, you know, you're losing your sense of caring or motivation. Hygiene, you're losing your sense of hygiene, your, you know, ability to take care of yourself, or having a flat affect, no emotion. So that's what they mean by the positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Here are some other examples of negative symptoms. There can be anhedonia, which is loss of pleasure, being asocial, having a volition or lack of motivation, a flat affect, or elogia, diminished speech. There's these three disorders within this category that are all really similar to each other, and essentially what it comes down to is the time. So if you've had these symptoms for less than a month, you might be diagnosed with brief psychotic disorder. If it's been between one and six months, you might have schizophreniform disorder. And then if it's been happening for at least six months, then you have full-blown schizophrenia. In terms of schizoaffective disorder, um, you basically have the diagnostic criteria for depression or bipolar, and also some of the criteria for schizophrenia. So it's kind of a, a double whammy of both of those. The next category here is bipolar and related disorders. You have three different ones in here. 
And it's important to know that mania doesn't necessarily mean that you're just happy all the time. It's categorized by these things, having excessive energy, restlessness, risky behavior. So classic examples would be going out and um, having sex, uh, unprotected sex with a bunch of people or gambling or going on big shopping sprees, euphoria, limited speech, racing thoughts and grandiosity. So those are some, some ways of being manic. You may have an elevated mood as well, but you're usually gonna have some of, some of these other um, options as well. And then I created this graphic to sort of show um, the different types. And so bipolar, is, bipolar one is the most severe. You need to be having symptoms of both depression and uh, mania for at least one week to be diagnosed with uh, bipolar one. And then bipolar two, you can be hypomanic, which is just not quite as severe as full-blown mania. And that only needs to last for four days. And your depression with these also has to last for at least two weeks. And then cyclothymia is subclinical levels of depression or mania um, that occurs for two years, at least half of the time, and is constant for at least two months. Another common misconception with bipolar is that you switch from one second to the next. One minute you're happy, and then you just change on a dime and you're sad. And that may be the case for some people, but you often see it manifested in these longer periods of depression for a couple weeks, and then mania for a week or two, and then cycling back and forth that way. The next category is depressive disorders. We have four within this disorder. The first is disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, which is temper outbursts that are out of proportion to the situation in intensity or duration. They're inconsistent with a developmental level. And the age of onset has to be at least 10 years. So this is for kiddos. And um, they can only be diagnosed with this after age 18. So if your um, friend or boss or spouse is having temper outbursts, unfortunately, uh, they cannot be diagnosed with this disorder. It's only for, for children. And as I mentioned earlier, it was really created in response to an overdiagnosis of childhood bipolar disorders. Major depressive disorder is perhaps one of the most commonly diagnosed disorders in the DSM and one of the common ones that social workers help to work with and address. You have at least uh, one of either a depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure, and then at least uh, five or more of some other different symptoms, which include um, weight loss or gain, sluggishness, fatigue, um, having trouble concentrating, sleeping too much, sleeping not enough, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, and all of this has to be going on for at least two weeks. The PHQ-9, the Patient Health Questionnaire 9, is a common diagnostic tool for this, as well as the Beck Depression Inventory. Persistent depressive disorder, I added this photo here of just a, a slow drizzle like you might see in the Northwest, um, Pacific Northwest, and that's basically this low-grade, long-lasting depression that is lasting at least two years and uh, with less than two months in between episodes, but sometimes it's at those subclinical levels. We also have a controversial disorder in here, PMDD, or premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So you have two criterions. You need to have at least one of criterion A, which is affective lability, basically meaning you have um, your labile, you go up and down in your affect, your, your mood, um, your emotions. Irritability, your anger, depressed mood, and anxiety. Those are criterion A. And then you need at least five or more total from both of these lists, and you can also take things from list B, which is decreased interest in activities, poor concentration, being lethargic, appetite changes, hypersomnia or insomnia, feeling overwhelmed, and having physical symptoms like bloating or breast soreness. And of course, there is controversy about you know, how much of this is um, typical for most women and, and if it's pathologizing that or whether it's an appropriate diagnosis that, that helps um, women who are affected to a greater degree by these issues. The next category here is anxiety disorders. This is another one that social workers should definitely be very familiar with, and I'll talk about a few. Separation anxiety disorder um, is typically uh, diagnosed in children, um, and they have to have it for at least four weeks. So if you start preschool with little Timmy and he cries when you drop him off at, uh, at daycare or preschool, 
and has a hard time, that doesn't mean he has separation anxiety disorder unless it really lasts for um, at least four weeks. And then for adults, they can get separation anxiety disorder as well, but the, the window of how long you have to be displaying the symptoms is much longer at six months. Selective mutism, where you're, you're not speaking, it has to occur in specific social situations, but not all the time. Specific phobia, there's four different main types listed in the DSM, animal, natural environment, blood slash injection slash injury, and then situational, something like planes or elevators. Some other ones that you might be um, familiar with or that are not listed in the DSM is ecmophobia, which is the fear of sharp objects like needles, and emetophobia, which is the th fear of throwing up. Panic disorder, um, so a panic attack is just criterion A. So a panic attack is at least four of these listed here. And then a panic disorder is having um, these and some of these as well. So the panic attack criteria would be things like a pounding heart, sweating, trembling, shortness of breath, chest pain, feeling like you can't breathe or that you're choking, um, dizziness, tingling, a fear of dying, that kind of thing. And then with a panic disorder, you might also uh, develop worry about having another panic attack and having maladaptive behavior changes like avoiding the situations that cause you to have a panic attack. Agoraphobia is fear and avoidance of at least two of these things. Public transit, open spaces, enclosed spaces, lines or crowds, or leaving the house. Generalized anxiety, anxiety disorder is another one that's pretty common. Um, this is often tested for using the GAD-7 uh, diagnostic tool. It has to list, last for at least six months, and you need to experience at least three of these. Uh, restlessness, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, being irritable, sleep disturbances, and muscle tension. Obsessive compulsive and related disorders includes five different disorders here. And there's a difference between obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder, OCPD. So with OCD, you have obsessions and compulsions. Obsessions are frequent upsetting thoughts, and compulsions are behaviors that are used to assuage those obsessions. So the classic examples might be someone who um, feels like they need to turn the door handle three times every time they lock the door, or they're you know, compulsively checking to make sure that the oven was turned off. Whereas OCPD, personality disorder, is more someone who, for lack of a better word, is really anal, right? They're, they're really controlling, they're perfectionist, they're very orderly, they have rigid rule following. So if you've ever seen the show Monk, this might be an example of someone with OCPD. Body dysmorphic disorder is a preoccupation with a perceived deficit in your appearance, but that's not observable um, or appears minor to other people. And then you also have repetitive behaviors like looking in the mirror um, and mental acts like comparing yourself to others. It's different than um, than a eating disorder, and I would encourage you to look at the differential diagnosis to find out more about that. Hoarding disorder includes difficulty or distress parting with possessions regardless of their actual value. It might be something like trash that uh, other people might think doesn't have real value. That distress is due to a perceived need to save those items, and the whole thing results in accumulation um, with clutter to the point that it's compromising the attended use of that space. So filling up a bathtub or making it so the person can't sleep on their bed anymore, for example. Trauma and stressor related disorders include these five, which I'll go into some of these in a bit more detail. But it's important to know that trauma is any situation that can leave a client feeling overwhelmed and alone and can be traumatic even if it does not involve physical harm. So there's several things associated with, uh, with trauma, being uh, not prepared for the trauma, having it be unexpected, a sense of powerless, ha having it be repeated, there being cruelty, and it occurring in childhood. Those are just some of the same things that are often associated with feeling traumatized by something. And then these two disorders are sort of opposites of each other. I made this graphic to, to illustrate that, but they're both diagnosed in childhood and they both include a history of insufficient care or neglect. 
The first is disinhibited social engagement disorder, where a child is overly familiar or friendly with strangers and they're prone to like wander off and become best friends with a random person. And then reactive attachment disorder is the opposite, where you're more inhibited and withdrawn and there may be some social or emotional disturbances associated with that as well. Post-traumatic stress disorder has several different criteria. I'm not going to go through and read all of these, um, but if you want to go ahead and pause the video and take a look, you need to have at least one of the first three, and then at least two of the fourth one, uh, and then you may also have some in criterion E. So take a look at these different criteria that are related to stressors, intrusive thoughts, avoidance, negative mood or cognition, and altered arousal or affect. Acute distress disorder is similar um, to the diagnostic uh, criteria and symptoms to PTSD, but with uh, it being between three days to a month, and so it's often known as being a precursor to PTSD. Adjustment disorder is sometimes used as a bit of a catch-all um, for distress that is out of proportion to a stressor and results in social or occupational impairment. The stressor had to have happened a, a three months or less ago from the onset of symptoms. And once the stressor ends, the symptoms need to also end within six months. So you basically are supposed to get over it within six months. And it the next category is dissociative disorders. And there are three different types of dissociative disorders. DID or dissociative identity disorder is perhaps one of the most commonly misunderstood disorders. And so sometimes people confuse uh, this with schizophrenia. They think that schizophrenia is having multiple personalities. And the idea is not called multiple personality disorder, but that's what you might hear people refer to this concept as. And it's very, very rare um, where basically someone often in response to a trauma uh, develops these uh, multiple um, different kind of manifestations of their identity within them and that they're dissociated from each other. Dissociative amnesia is the inability to recall autobiographical information, and sometimes it's related to stress or trauma and not explained by ordinary forgetfulness or something like dementia. And you can specify if it's with few, which means wandering. So someone with dissociative amnesia might just not know who they are. The next are depersonalization or derealization disorders. So depersonalizations is feelings of unreality or detachment that are related to their thoughts, feelings, and body. So the self, the person, as in depersonalization. And then derealization is similar, but it's related to surroundings or objects in the room. Somatic symptom and related disorders. Uh, there are three different types here in the DSM, and, and I'm, I'm mentioning, uh, well, a few different ones here. So I've created this graphic that I think helps explain things, because often there is, there's confusion about all these different types. And so you first have somatic symptom disorder, which is where you have distressing real symptoms, but then your thoughts, feelings, or behaviors are excessive or disproportionate. So maybe you have a high level anxiety or basically blowing something that's real out of proportion. Illness anxiety disorder is more like being a hypochondriac. You might be excessively fearful or worried about health, even though there is no or very minimal symptoms. Conversion disorder is often um, due to some kind of psychological stress and it results in a body manifestation, usually a loss of function, like suddenly feeling like you're paralyzed or you can't see. And then factitious disorder, which was previously known as Munchausen sister, excuse me, Munchausen syndrome, um, is basically falsifying physical or psychological symptoms, but without there being an obvious external incentive. And that's differentiated from malingering, which is intentional faking for an external incentive, like calling in sick for work or trying to get prescription opioid medications as, as examples. So factitious disorder uh, used to be known as Munchausen syndrome, and then Munchausen syndrome by proxy is now known as factitious disorder imposed on another. So those are the somatic symptom disorders. Next, we have feeding and eating disorders. And pika, or pika, some people refer to it as, um, is basically eating non-food items. Um, and so I have an image here of my strange addiction 
you can see lots of examples of this disorder with um, people on, on live stream addiction on TLC. Avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. I've got the criteria here, so you need to have at least one of these. Weight loss, nutritional deficiency, interference with psychosocial functioning, dependence on feeding tube or nutritional Ooh. supplements, and having it be not better explained by a lack of food or a culturally sanctioned practice like fasting or an eating disorder. Um, and the anorexia nervosa has these three main components. You've got a distorted self-perception, a fear of weight gain, and then food restriction that results in significantly low weight. And anorexia nervosa is actually the most um, deadly of, of the disorders in the DSM-5. Bulimia nervosa is associated with binge eating and then purging, often through vomiting or sometimes through laxative use or excessive exercise. Binge eating disorder is within two hours eating more than is normal or appropriate, and you might feel a lack of control over that eating. You have two elimination disorders here that I'm going to note, enuresis and encapresis, basically involuntary urinating or having an involuntary bowel movement. Sleep-wake disorders, um, you've got things like insomnia, where you can't sleep, hypersomnolence, where you sleep too much, narcolepsy, where you're falling asleep like all of a sudden, uh, breathing related, um, which includes sleep apnea, and then parasomnias that include movements like sleepwalking or things like that. There's also a category of sexual dysfunction. Some people are surprised to hear that this is a part of the DSM, but these issues like uh, erectile disorder, ED, um, even premature ejaculation or orgasmic disorders, sexual interest and arousal disorders are included in the DSM. And as you can imagine, some of these are a bit controversial as well. Gender dysphoria um, is something that has certainly had controversy as to whether it should be included in the DSM or not, you know, given current um, cultural trends and increasing acceptance of um, gender fluid individuals or, or things like that. And the, the main criteria with gender dysphoria that you need to be aware of is that it must cause distress and or problems in functioning. You also have disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders. There are several uh, of the, this fun category as well. One to know about here is oppositional defiant disorder. Someone is angry or irritable, vindictive and argumentative or defiant. Intermittent explosive disorder is where the behavior is grossly disproportionate to the stressor. So basically they're having verbal um, or behavioral outbursts or tantrums that are out of proportion. Conduct disorder is one to, to certainly be aware of um, because this can sometimes uh, turn into uh, antisocial personality disorder. So it's usually associated with aggression to people or animals, destruction of property, a serious violation of rules, and deceitfulness or theft. And you can specify if you also have limited pro-social emotions like empathy. Then we have antisocial personality disorder, which is also listed in personality disorders. You may have noticed I've mentioned a couple personality disorders so far, um, and sometimes they're in two places depending on what categories they fit into. So these are the criteria of antisocial personality disorder. It must, you must be at least 18 years old though to get the diagnosis and it needs to start at at least 15 years old. So things like unlawful behavior, a lack of remorse, being irresponsible, impulsive, aggressive, deceitful, and reckless. The next category, especially relevant for folks who may want to pursue their, pursue their LCDC, is substance-related and addictive disorders. This is the list of all the different uh, substances, I suppose, that the DSM lists. So you've got alcohol, caffeine, cannabis or marijuana, hallucinogens, inhalants, opioids, sedatives, stimulants, and tobacco. And all of these are organized into the following categories. You've got whatever substance use disorder, so alcohol use disorder, and then you have alcohol intoxication, alcohol withdrawal. The only exception to that is caffeine here. It doesn't have a use disorder, just caffeine intoxication, intoxication and caffeine withdrawal. Uh, and I'll, no I'll uh, note too that the only addictive um, disorder in the DSM is gambling.
neurocognitive disorders, I've separated delirium out here because delirium is not really a true form of dementia, whereas many of these other diseases are known as being kind of within that umbrella category. Delirium is temporary and it's reversible. It's often caused by a change in medications or dehydration, something that if you reverse the cause, like change the medications or get the person hydrated, they will get better. Whereas these other blue boxes are neurocognitive disorders or types of dementia that are progressive and not reversible, at least not at this time. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common one that's associated with those plaques and tangles in the brain. Frontotemporal impacts, as you can imagine, the frontotemporal regions of the brain, and that's often associated with aggression and um, impulsivity or you know, lowered inhibitions. Lewy body dementia uh, is sometimes associated with hallucinations, so that might sometimes be misdiagnosed as something like schizophrenia. Vascular uh, dementia, which is something like a stroke. You can also have mixed dementias where you have multiple. So maybe you have uh, the plaques and tangles from Alzheimer's, but you also had a stroke resulting in vascular dementia in a different part of the brain. Things like HIV or AIDS, uh, Parkinson's and Huntington's can also progress to neurocognitive disorders at late stages of the disease. And then prion is associated um, with prions, as you can imagine, similar to mad cow disease. Now we have personality disorders. There are three different clusters, or I guess categories of personality disorders. Cluster A is defined by odd or eccentric behavior. So you've got paranoid personality disorder, schizoid, which if I'm going to boil it down to one simplified word, it's someone who's, who's a loner, and schizotypal or schizotypal, um, which is someone who is essentially odd or eccentric or weird. Of course, there's a lot more nuance to these, um, but this is just a very, very high level brief overview. Cluster B is someone who has dramatic or erratic behavior. Antisocial personality disorder, I mentioned before. Borderline personality disorder is really characterized by instability and extremes. You know, they love you, they hate you, and is often also associated with suicidal uh, ideation or behavior. Histrionic is associated with attention seeking or seductive behavior. And narcissistic personality disorder is an inflated self image. Finally, we have cluster C, which is uh, anxious, nervous personality disorders. So avoidant personality disorder, dependent personality disorder, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Next, we have paraphilic disorders. These are basically um, sexual disorders that are not like I mentioned before, where it's like ejaculation disorders or something like that, but rather these kind of sexual conduct disorders. Voyeuristic, where like it's a peeping tom, they get pleasure out of watching people without their knowledge or consent. Exhibitionist, um, so things, things like flashing would be an example. Frauderistic, so basically touching or groping someone without their consent, like if someone's feeling up someone on the train. Sexual masochism, where the person gets off on receiving pain, and then sadism, um, where they get off on inflicting pain. Pedophilic, obviously children, being attracted uh, to children. Fetishistic, which can be either body parts or non-living objects like shoes or leather and transvestic or cross-dressing. And the, the note here is that you have to get um, sexual gratification from the cross-dressing and not be related to, to gender identity issues. We're getting close to the end here. We finally got other mental disorders. You can basically have two categories of other mental disorders, either another specified mental disorder or an unspecified mental disorder. You've also got medication-induced movement disorders or other adverse effects of medication. Here are three common ones, um, the first being tardive dyskinesia. This is associated with long-term use of um, typical antipsychotic medications, and you might see it with things like lip smacking or um, moving the tongue or jaw in a very distinctive way. If you um, go on YouTube and look up videos of this, that's a better way of explaining it. Acute dystonia, which is abnormal positioning or postures of the muscles, also sometimes caused by some of these different types of drugs, antipsychotic, antidepressant, or antiemetic. 
And then um, akesthesia, uncontrollable urges like to fidget or walk, and that's also related to antipsychotic meds. And then the DSM-5 also has this category called other conditions that may be a focus of clinical attention. These are not mental disorders, but they include other, I guess, environmental or issue-related conditions like uh, child abuse or neglect, relational issues, problems at work or at school, um, financial problems, that kind of thing. And then finally, there's conditions for further study. So uh, if you want to be up on the, um, <clears throat> the leading edge of uh, psychological studies, I would guess that some of these may make an appearance in future versions of the DSM because that's often where um, new disorders first live is in this conditions for further study. So some interesting one here is internet gaming disorder. There was a lot of um, discussion about whether to include that in the DSM as well as things like suicidal uh, behavior and non-suicidal self-injury uh, as well. So I know that that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. I hope that this was a helpful overview and I encourage you to um, get a copy of the DSM-5 yourself and learn a lot more uh, detail about these conditions. Thanks for your time. Good luck.